Today, as we come to the table. Isn't it amazing? Now, if you don't come from a background where you lived kind of really bad before you came to Christ, you cannot associate with this. But for those of us who lived really bad before we gave our life to the Lord, why is it that we remember how fun the party was, but we don't remember the vomit? It wasn't fun. There may have been moments. Hey, you know, you're the life of the party until you're on the floor sick and feeling horrible and, you know, whatever the case might be, or waking up in jail. As I say, man, it was better when I was sick all the time. I was going to jail. This church stuff stinks, you know. Hey, it may be a battle and we may have to sacrifice as believers, but Jesus is good, isn't he? People come to Jesus from all walks of life. You may have learned about Him at an early age, or you may be brand new to faith today. You may have a rocky backstory, or maybe you were basically, quote, good, but missing something. Whatever your story, there has been a change in your lifestyle. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, senior pastor of Calvary Knoxville. Pastor Mark will be addressing the goodness of God today. He'll be reminding you where the Israelites have been and what they were rescued from. Their lives were completely changed. Pastor Mark will also give you a glimpse of how God planned to provide for them as they traveled to the promised land and why it was important for them to trust the Lord. Well, let's join Pastor Mark in Exodus chapter 16 as he continues his message, Grumbling Against the Lord. There are two things that happen to Christians as we go through our life, and God brings out the chisels. We either get bitter or we get better. The bitter is we get our heart gets hard, and I don't know that I can forgive them. And I think this is, and, uh, and, uh, and God said, I'm doing this. You're grumbling against me. Don't you see I put them in your life? Don't you see I had them say that? Don't you see that I moved that situation to be that way? Lord, that's you. Yes. If you'll just let me do it and stay humble, I'll make you like my son, my son, the true rock who is beautiful to me. And I'm molding you and shaping you, my bride, to be what I want you to be forever. See, it's a beautiful thing if we can understand it. Can we evaluate? You know, is it okay to look at someone maybe? Because you can't take this to the extreme. No, stay with me. If you take this to the extreme and say, okay, Mark, then every authority in my life or every circumstance is a good one. God, you wanted this person to come and to, you know, rape a family member. No. Or God, you wanted there to be a false teacher at our church. No. You have to evaluate. You have to use the word of God to evaluate. So understand there's a difference. This is not a a blanket statement. This could be used by certain leaders to really lord over people. And I've even heard pastors say things like, don't question God's anointed. You You guys have probably heard that. And they try to put themselves in a position where they're too high to even question. They're the authority and whatever. And it's like, no. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, test the spirits to see whether they be of the Lord or not. And Paul talked about the Bereans. He said he went to different churches and taught. He said, when I went to Berea, they were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians because the Bereans didn't just believe everything I said. They went to the Bible to make sure it was true. So making sure that somebody is teaching the Bible right Making sure that someone is living for the Lord accurate, those are things we are required to do. Is everybody with me? We're not to just kind of let people run over us and do whatever and it be something demonic. I'm just giving us the balance here to understand that when God does put us in a place where we know that God has called that person, where we know that God has called us to be there, then we need to say, okay, God, whatever you're doing, go for it. I'm not going to fight it. I'm not going to grumble. I'm not going to complain. Change me. I'm ready. And let God do it. You know, I'm telling you, if we can learn to let God use the authorities in our life, then our life is so much easier. God taught me that lesson early on as a baby Christian. And if we don't learn how to be men and women under authority, then we can never be men and women in authority. So there's the proper balance there. 
This is when we get in trouble, when we start grumbling or complaining against circumstances and or leaders who are simply doing and teaching what God has asked them to do and teach. That's when we get in trouble with God. Why? Because it's God who put them there. And God who is directing and controlling them. Doesn't mean they're perfect. It just means God's in control. And this is what we'll see tonight with Moses and the children of Israel. Now, as we jump into chapter 16 here, remember last time we left off, they'd been preserved from thirst. They had the whole thing there where they went to the desert and they couldn't find any water after three days. And they began to grumble and complain against Moses and Aaron. They're going to do the same thing. Now, again, I want to just speak a little bit of grace here because these are baby Christians. At this point, God is extremely gracious. They are baby, baby Christians. Baby Christians grumble. But God expects us to grow. God expects us to mature. And if we're still grumbling after, you know, 10 years down the road, there's a problem. We need to be maturing. Really, we shouldn't be grumbling after five years down the road. We should be saying, God, I trust you, you know, and maybe have an occasional stumble and we lose it or something, but not living a life of... And I've seen Christians that do that. They live a life of grumbling, a life of complaining, a life of bitterness. And it's horrible because they basically live their whole life out in the wilderness. And that's another picture that God gives us. These are the kind of people that live their life in the wilderness spiritually. And they die in the wilderness spiritually because they never get to go into the promised land. Why? Because they're only bitter and grumbling and everything's wrong and they can't move on in Christ. If we're going to be those that can take the fullness that God has promised us down here, we've got to grow beyond this, guys. And some of you are probably being challenged right now tonight because you've got an issue or you've got a person or you've got something going on. God's saying, it's time to move on. It's time to grow. I want to take you into what I've promised. I have so much for you, but you're going to die. You're going to live your life in a spiritual wilderness and you're going to die there if you don't let me work. And so that's where it started here again last week with them grumbling against Moses and Aaron. They didn't have any water. You know, they're baby Christians. They don't, it's okay. That's all right. Uh, you know, and so God does it. Now we see chapter 16. That was the first test was water. Now we see a test of hunger. Look at verse one. And they journeyed from Elim. And again, this is the children of Israel traveling through the wilderness after they'd come out of Egypt. They journeyed from Elim and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of sin. Well, that's kind of funny. Isn't it? I know it doesn't mean that, but so which is between uh, Elim and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month. And they departed after rather they departed from the land of Egypt. And then the entire congregation of the children of Israel, i.e. baby Christians, all right? I'm not taking up for them, but I'm giving them grace here. Complained against the pastor and his assistant. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's exactly what we're looking at. Against Moses and Aaron. I don't like that pastor. I don't like what the assistant pastor said. I don't think, it is, whatever, you know. That happens with a baby. It's, okay. it's a baby Christian. I'm not saying it's okay, but it happens. And notice they complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat. Literally, the King James calls it the flesh pots. I like that a lot better because that's what they're doing is living after the flesh. And when we ate bread to the full, you know, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the entire assembly with hunger. <laughs> Moses and Aaron just wanted to see them grow. Moses and Aaron just wanted to love them. Moses and Aaron just wanted to give them instruction so they could grow in their faith and they could make it to the promised land. And when it got hard, what happened? Rather than allowing God to use Moses and Aaron in their life, what'd they do? They grumbled and complained and they blamed Moses and Aaron. Pretty intense. False accusation. You just led us here to kill us. Again, it's the exact opposite. He led them there so they might have life. They would be saved from the bondage of Egypt. But if they're Moses and Aaron, they're blaming. And notice the whole congregation coming against them. This is, not, again, not a pleasant situation for Moses and Aaron. There were a lot of them. This is over 2 million people. How would you like it if you were leading a church of over 2 million people and they all were against you? Think about that. Any ministry, anything you're leading, over 2 million people, they all don't like you. And the sad thing is we see they do this the entire 40 years. Were it not for God intervening you know, more than once in supernatural power, they would have killed Moses. I mean, they tried to kill him more than once. Man, tough situation, but how sad for both of them. Again, those complaining who are living the miserable life and Moses and Aaron who had to put up with them. But again, it's the thing of growing past it. They're saying basically it would have been better to have died than to follow you here. <laughs> how sad. Because really what they're saying, they'd rather have stayed in Egypt or the world unsaved than be with the children of God and follow his direction. But guys, here's the difference. The difference is eternity. It's those who know the Lord and those who don't. You know, what a great disservice we do. You know, sometimes following the Lord is hard. It's hard to follow the Lord. 
And the children of Israel finding that out. God will test us with different things. God is now testing them to see whether or not they trust if God will provide their needs. Who's going to pay the rent? How am I going to buy groceries? What are we going to do? You know, who's going to cover the electric bill? Whatever. God will take all of us there as believers. At some point, he'll take us there where there's a little bit of a question so that he'll find out, do you trust me or not? Do you really think I will? Then he's, God's going to test us. And that's where the real test comes in, how we respond to it. I have to say that a lot of times when these tests have come, I haven't done so good. And then there's other times the tests will come and I do good. And it's because I remember what God did before. It's a great disservice to tell anybody, give your life to Jesus and everything's great. Life will be easy. Don't worry about it, right? That is a huge disservice, guys. Don't tell anybody. Look, if somebody says they want to give their life to the Lord, say, are you sure you want to do this? This is hard. Now, my job is to tell you about the Lord and to lead you to Christ, but are you sure you want to do this? Because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. It's going to be hard, and God's going to test you, and then the enemy's going to come against you and fight against you. You know, it's bittersweet for me as a dad to watch my girls step out in ministry. Lieli has stepped out really boldly in ministry. All the girls do ministry at their different levels. But Liel doing this little class with the girls, and I remember when she stepped out to do this, I started thinking, she's going to really get whacked. Because, see, the enemy doesn't care. Well, come on, she's a kid. So... Lay off her guys till she gets older, and then we're coming after her. He would like to kill her because she's doing a, a Bible study with some other girls. He would like to kill me. He'd like to kill you. Now, God won't let him, but I've been praying for her, and if you think about it, pray for her. You know, just, you know, she doing the class while, and really getting beat up here lately. And she just came in my office, you know, it's like, well, it's really hard, Dad. And I said, how do you really come under attack? I said, when an adult steps on the battlefield, it is hard when a kid who hasn't been as weathered or seasoned steps on the battlefield, it's even harder. She's getting beat up. She's getting whacked from all sides. All kinds of things going on. I just pray for her. That's what I'm doing. I'm praying for her. I lift her up. And the neat thing about it is she's not going to quit. She knows what it is. She recognizes the spiritual battle. And she's like, she's not going to quit. She's going to keep going. And, and, but we have to realize that we, when people give their life to the Lord and they say, I'm going to step in the battlefield... You know, it's just a lie. It would be like telling a soldier, you know, you're in the heat of battle in, say, Iraq or Afghanistan or maybe a, a more heated battle like Vietnam or something that's running all the time. And you, the soldier's getting ready to jump out of the helicopter and land down in the fields and you say, you know what? This is great. You're going to love this. <laughs> it's really easy and you never get hurt. There's no real challenges. You'll never be afraid. Nobody really shoots at you. And if they do, they miss by a mile. Go have fun. Go have a good time. And by the time you're done with them, they're yelling, we, as they're jumping out of the helicopter. Until the reality of the ground hits and the bullets start whizzing by their helmet. And they hit the ground and go, this is not what I was told in boot camp. Now, they don't do that. They warn the soldiers. They teach them. They know that. But I'm using an analogy. How should we be any different with baby believers? It's going to be easy, man. It's good. This, all your problems are solved and whatever. You say, you know what? This is going to be a real challenge. You're going to have to sacrifice things. You're going to get whacked on all sides. You're going to be falsely accused. You're going to be attacked. You're going to have the world hate you. All these things are going to happen. Are you sure you want to do this? Now, I'm not saying we should try to talk them out of it, but I think sometimes we need to let them know, you know, once they give their life, I don't think it's appropriate that day, you know, they come give their life or come forward, you know, and you go down and tell them you're going to die. You know, that's probably not the best thing to do. <laughs> but as soon as you start discipleship, they come to Christ, and you sit there and begin to disciple them. I think we really need to tell them. We need to be honest and say, now look, I want you to know something. This is not going to be easy. This is going to be hard. You've got to make a commitment. If you don't make a commitment, you're not going to make it. You're going to walk away or else fall back in the world. Because the enemy is going to come at you with all of his God. He's going to try to pull you away. And so we have to make up our mind. I'm going to do this thing. It requires sacrifice. And, and notice it's amazing to me. They act as if Egypt was awesome. You notice this. Why? They wish we'd have died when it was so great in Egypt. We had all this food and everything was great. You were slaves. They beat you with whips while you stomped in the mud to make bricks for the cities of Egypt. You worked all day long with no wages. They would throw you slop on the table or whatever and make you get up early the next morning. You really like that? Isn't it amazing? Now, if you don't come from a background where you lived kind of really bad before you came to Christ, you cannot associate with this. But for those of us who lived really bad before we gave our life to the Lord, why is it that we remember how fun the party was, but we don't remember the vomit? It wasn't fun. There may have been moments. Hey, you know, you're the life of the party until you're on the floor sick and feeling horrible and, you know, whatever the case might be, or waking up in jail. As I say, man, it was better when I was sick all the time. I was going to jail. This church stuff stinks, you know. Hey, it may be a battle and we may have to sacrifice as believers, but Jesus is good, isn't he? 
He is good. So they're doing this. Again, this is, they're young. This is the flesh. And they, notice they blame Moses here. You brought us out. Who brought them out there? The Lord did. See, the Lord's the one controlling their circumstances, but they're turning it on Moses. And then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out together for a certain quota each day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Now, we're going to see that God corrects them, but God doesn't seem angry at them, does he? Now, God doesn't like us grumbling, but we see a lot. We see grace here. God says, I hear you're grumbling. We're going to see that in a minute. But we see grace from the Lord because God knows they're baby Christians. Again, I'm not taking up for their sin. But, you know, God's not saying I'm going to wipe them out right now for this. He's saying, look, I'm going to rain bread from heaven, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota each day that I may test them. Now, I have that underlined. That I may test them. See, God's testing to see whether or not they're going to grumble, whether or not they're going to obey, whether or not they trust that he'll provide all the things they need, whether they will walk in my law or not. And so in response to their questions, God says, I'm going to give you bread because you say you're hungry, but I'm not only going to give you bread, it's going to rain down from heaven. In other words, not only will your needs be met, but it will be like a rainstorm. Isn't that great? God will give us all we need and more. And God is always faithful to supply the needs of every believer if it has to be even supernatural rain from heaven. Guys, I've seen God do this in my life. You know, sometimes you tell stories like this and there's people that hear it and they don't believe it. I don't care what people believe or not care, but I'll tell you a couple things that happened that were just supernatural. You know, there was one time where I, my bank account was low. I had no money in my bank account. I remember being a baby Christian. The bills were due. They were due. I had to send them off, but there was no money in the account. But by faith, I paid everything that had to be paid because God said he would provide for me if I put him first. And I was putting him first. So there it was. There it goes. I didn't have the money to pay this bill that needed to be paid. And I knew the bank account was empty. I'd emptied everything out. I left $5 in there, I think, so that the account would still be open. It was due day. So I said, all right, Lord, you promised. So I called up the bank. I said, could you please tell me what's in account number? Boom, boom. They looked it up. $200. I had just cleared it out. I ran it down purposely to $5. I needed $200 to pay my bill. Now, somebody said, God doesn't just put money in bank accounts. I believe my God does. If I need something, because I, if I've been faithful to the Lord to do what God has asked me to do, and there's something that has to be done, God's going to test me to see if I trust him. I saw him do it. And I'm not writing a book about it, and I'm not trying to impress anybody about it. I'm just telling you so you can know it's real. I've shared with you guys, and I hate to use the same examples all the time, but I give personal examples in my life. I remember being down to my last 20 bucks one time, again, Nashville again all over. I'm shopping like midnight, you know, get off late from work. I worked at Bennigan's waiting tables. I get off late. I go down to Kroger down there, and it's 11 or 12 midnight. I've got my last 20. I buy $20 worth of food. All that I need is going to be fine until I get paid again. No problem. But it was all the money I had. I go to pay for it, and my 20 has gone. I just had it in my pocket. And probably didn't just get off from work because I would have had more than that waiting tables. But I don't remember I only had $20 where I was before. I'm not sure. But I stood there in the line going, Okay, I don't have any more money. I don't get paid for a couple days. And I just bought $20 worth. I know I calculated it up. I've got to have something here. And I remember looking at the lady or whoever was behind the counter, and there I was. And, and I was like, I said, you know what? I, um, I've misplaced my money. Can you just keep this here for a minute? She said, yes. I went out to the front of Kroger's. I remember it was so late. There was nobody around. It was like dead in Nashville. A few cars going by, one or two straight cars in the parking lot. You know how that is. Somebody leaves their car parked there or whatever. And I'm pacing back and forth on the side in front of Kroger saying, God, you promised you promised. And I wasn't challenging him. I was just confirming. You promised. So what do you want me to do? God, you know I had that 20. I, I don't know where it is or what happened. I watched a car pull off the road into the parking lot. And there weren't many cars to watch, so my eyes glued to it. The car pulls all the way up. Again, some of you have heard this. I apologize if you have, but it's just perfect for this example. He pulls all the way up. He stops right in front of the Kroger where I am. He gets out of his car. It's like one of those old, I think they're called a gremlin. Remember with the flat back, whatever kind of... He gets out of this thing. He leans over the top of the car to me there in the middle. He goes, did you drop this? It was a 20. I said, yes, I did. I took the 20. I went in and paid for my groceries and left. And I was just praising God saying, you are amazing. You are amazing. If manna needs to be rained from heaven, God will rain manna from heaven. I didn't know that angels drove faded gremlins. <laughs> that guy was thinking was it somebody god just moved in the heart was a guy following me in kroger saw me drop it and took off with it and god convicted him he came back i don't know i'd like to know the story behind that but again it doesn't matter god is great isn't he 
God is going to test them. He's going to find out, do you really believe that if you'll be faithful to me and put me first, that I can even rain bread from heaven? I mean, I can send rain down, bread down in the form of rain. I can bring it down to you. Now, when you think about how much food, Gus says, I'm going to give them food in the desert. I'm going to supply for you. Think about how much food. I looked this up today. How much food would it take to feed over 2 million people in the desert every day for 40 years? The number is astronomical, but just one day, get this. It's estimated that to feed two and a half million people, which is probably what was there for just one day, would take 2,250 tons of food. And water, it would take 1.25 million gallons. This was every day for 40 years in the wilderness. How big is our God? This is a wilderness. There aren't resources. They didn't have gardens. There weren't streams running through the wilderness. Our God is amazing. Now, this is where it gets challenging. Now, do you have a need that needs to be met? Do you think that God cannot meet the need that you have when God was able to give over 2,200 and some tons of food every day and 1.2 million gallons of water to over 2 million people for 40 years every day in the wilderness and God's not going to be able to get you out of your situation or cover what you've got going on? Think about it for a minute. This is where our faith grows. We say, God, look, if you did that, all I need is 300 bucks to pay that bill off. This is nothing. It's nothing for you. It does something to our mind. And listen, I'm telling you, God will have to allow you to be tested in those areas because until you're tested, you won't grow. If you get in a place where you find out you're being tested in those areas and you watch God be faithful, you grow and you trust him. So again, remember the next time you begin to wonder whether or not God can supply your need. It puts everything in perspective. And God's going to use this situation, he says, as a test. Uh, That is, he'll supply it, but he'll do it in such a way they'll be tested And how's he going to test them? He's going to limit the amount. We'll see that he gives them the days that they can collect it in order to see if they'll be obedient or not. And so God's going to use all this. God says, all right, I see them. They're baby Christians. They're messing up big time. But I'm going to use this to grow them. I'm going to test them through this. Look at verse 5. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Now, why was that? The Sabbath. God didn't want them doing anything on the Sabbath. So he said, gather twice as much. You know, gather just a certain amount every day. But on the day before the Sabbath, you can gather two days worth and it'll be fine. And what's going to be interesting is if they left any of the days gathering, we're going to see that later on next time that it would breed worms and stink. But every time they gathered two days worth on the Sabbath, it would last. God would preserve it. Again, supernatural that God was doing here. And so the test here, God was going to see, will you obey my word? Are you going to give in to your desires and your emotions? And guys, God tests us the same way. Note this, when circumstances are hard, Will we still obey the word or deny our natural desires and emotions? See, this is where the rubber hits the road. Are we going to obey God's word even when we don't feel like obeying God's word? And no doubt, if you're in the wilderness and you found some food, you're going to try to get a whole lot to kind of hoard it up, right? Because you wonder when your next meal is going to be and where it's going to come from. And God says, no, no, no. You can only take two quarts a day. And so it comes out to quarts in our changeover when God begins to give the measurements a day. Then they could take four quarts a day per person when it came up to the two days. I mean, the logical thing to do in their flesh would be to gather as much as they could to hoard it up, you know, because you never know when you're going to get any more. And God said, nope, I want you to trust me. I want you to, to just take the day's amount and God will be faithful to provide if we'll simply do that. Huge lesson that each of us need to learn. Thanks for coming to the table of God's Word with Pastor Mark for his study in the book of Exodus. This Old Testament book of the Bible is an interesting one, as it's the end of one era for the people of Israel, heading into a new season for them that leads them back to their homeland. Through the events in this book, you'll learn of God's miraculous ways of bringing people to freedom. Just looking at the seemingly impossible things that God brought about through the book of Exodus helps you realize that He's a God of power, authority, and incredible majesty. The Israelites experienced this firsthand, but it didn't take long for them to forget what he'd done. Can you relate? Perhaps you've seen God work in your life in amazing ways, but it doesn't take long to be back in a place where you feel like God isn't working in your life. If that's so, we'd really like to be a support for you in prayer. If you go to thewaymedia.net, you'll find a questions and comments link. Go ahead and fill out this form, and we'd like to know what we can be praying for, as well as any thoughts or comments about what you've heard today. 
You can also listen to additional teachings at thewaymedia.net. That's all the time we have for today. But Pastor Mark has more to share from the miracle-filled book of Exodus. We hope you'll join us again and learn and grow in ways that God speaks to you personally related to the things written down in Exodus. We're thankful for you taking the time today to listen. And we look forward to you joining us the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.